suddenly sounded like a eulogy to uh, being an architect. <laughs> um, can we run this film? I'm going to read um, something which gives a background to me at the same time sets a scene to a film. It's only four minutes long. And there's a bit of music which we can have very low. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah? Okay. And <clears throat> it's essentially it's a poem, which is my biography in a few um, verses. On the rim of reason, the pulse from edge to the center and out again. I came to architecture from the edge, somewhere between the edge of medicine and the edge of art, wanting to help people and to express myself. Both my humanity and my art were intuitive. I think I was lucky with my DNA and the access I had to nature's wonders. I lived on the edge of architecture, yet the actions were central. I thought, I drew, and I built but I thought about society as much as form. I drew with a rapidograph, but also a brush. I tried connecting architecture schools and investigating free time space and speculating on where urbanism was going. I realized architecture in East Anglia and saw egos and business competitiveness. I built real buildings with my own hands, then taught architecture but not really. I had insufficient knowledge, but I nurtured the students and shared building buildings with them. Then I began to explore engineering while exploring a partnership and working and learning at Arup. I worked with industry, I researched, and I dirtied my hands in the workshop. And the boundaries of architecture that had begun to appear began to dissolve and I saw that I was out on the edge. I began an open partnership in France. No boundaries other than the sensual nature of buildings and streets and materials, light, landscape, and technique. I remained on the edge, but in the center of French political ambition, seminal exposés of public performance and technical innovation. A knowledge and feel for glass <clears throat> that brought me to the center because the image was so potent and sought after throughout Europe and later in the US and the rest of the world. But I had cracked a glass and wanted to move outward again to weave and deploy new materials that would evoke new ideas and spaces. I had knowledge I had become an uncle, maybe even wise as I began giving back to society. I am moving to the edge again, happy, and now I write as much as I draw. My imagination is still on the rim of reason, and I do not know my next architecture. But my responsibility is still towards humanity, and my memories give me strength for future work play, and life I share. <clears throat> they put me in the Perry room at the Perry Hotel, and I am in the center of the cathedral. So I think my beginning is the periphery. I was given the subject, centrality and periphery. For me, both personally and professionally, the periphery is a fertile place. It's an edge, a boundary zone, a frontier. You will remember 1989, the wall came down. East meets west. In Leipzig, the sky is brought down to the earth. And this Leipzig glass hall, the film you've just seen, I wrote a poem. Sorry, it's more poetry. But I think it's relevant. A framed emptiness brings down the sky to meet the earth. The diaphanous shell stretched taut over squared silhouettes of thin round metal. Light chases darkness. Shadows are holes in light.
colors flow throughout the space, sunlight and cloud, the shadows come and go. So when we speak of a frontier, <clears throat> we speak of a challenge. When we say something is cutting edge, we're talking of the most daring and creative manifestation of any field of knowledge or research. In the natural world, boundary zones are the peripheries where two ecosystems meet and are often the richest and most ecologically diverse. The same goes for when two intellectual ecosystems meet. In 1999, for the new millennium, I wrote an essay for the Irish Times titled Zero the Hero, describing some of the public architecture Zero has given birth to, and playing with some ideas of what it might stand for in relation to where we are headed as a society. It's roughly a thousand years ago that the Zero came into Europe via the Moors in, and brought it into Spain. And it originated, apparently, in around 630 AD with the astronomer Brahmagupta. But also, I was reminded correctly tonight by Paddy, front row, bottom right, that in fact the Mayans also had the zero roughly the same time. This opened up the possibility of negative numbers and a continuous number line stretching to infinity in both positive and negative directions. With the symbol zero, sunya, the nothingness, sitting at the boundary between positive and negative. It enables our entire system of mathematics to be at the very core of computer logic. Yet zero symbolizes the nothing, the void, an amazing concept by the human mind to have even come up with it. It also symbolizes the beginning, the center, the pause, the central point of balance between two forces, the symbol of unity, the trace of the infinite point. I'd also suggest it symbolizes the creative center, where synthesis replaces the duality between subject and object, and where the creativity fed by the periphery takes form. In order to enter the creative space, architects or artists or scientists must breach the borders of the rational. They must relinquish control and the security of their psychological and intellectual limits. It actually makes me think of engineers suddenly. I don't know why. There's a, an expression, because I do engineering and architecture, I'm often asked, what's the difference? And give an engineer a bow and arrow and a target, he'll pull and shoot, and it will land in the bullseye. The architect will rotate his shoulders a little bit, then his hips, and fire the arrow into the sky. So, we must ask the right questions. Question what is self-evident in order to create something genuinely new, essential and potentially meaningful. Do we have the next image? Yeah, and the next one. Met a dancer tonight, river dance lady. Baker? Butler. Butler. Wayne McGregor, resident artist in the Sainsbury Welcome Center for Neural Circuits and Behavior. And he, interestingly, is working with neuroscientists. And I asked him, are you working at speed? Because he's a very fast mover, Wayne McGregor. And he said, yes, I'm working with the Red Arrows, which is a display, aer aeronautic display team, at 600 miles an hour working on choreography, so it's amazing. We won an international competition in 1999 for a monument in Dublin to replace Nelson's Pillar, which had been destroyed by the IRA in 1966. We were, in essence, tasked to create a monument marking the heart of Ireland's capital city, its center, and the beginning of its renaissance. Monuments have been much in the news lately. Their historical meaning is often part of a narrative which is not always remembered 
or is no longer socially or ethically acceptable. Most monuments are didactic, which is why when their overt symbolism becomes unacceptable, they are torn down, or as in the case of Nelson's column, the pillar in Dublin, removed with more vigor and allowed, I think, one Irish band to announce that Nelson was Ireland's first astronaut. <laughs> Thinking about the notion of what is quintessentially Irish, manias, standing stones, ever-changing skies and light, and the emotions of a people who have probably produced more poets per capita than any other. I drew a line from earth to heaven. It was submitted as the monument of light, but has since obviously been renamed many times by the Irish, although there is one called the Spire, amongst others. And in Gaelic, I can't pronounce Tour Soleil. The form traces its lineage back to one of the most ancient, deliberate statements, marking man's presence in the landscape. Standing stones, and then in the city, the Egyptian obelisks, Trajan's column. The spire is three meters in diameter at its base and rises 120 meters. That's an aspect ratio of one to 40. Most columns in classical architecture are one to 10. Most engineers start freaking if you go over one to 20. So in, in essence, there is some stabilizing going on inside. But the point was it rose tapering, which on plan are a series of zeros, reducing in size, in diameter, all the way up. And yet when you look at it, it is one, a unity. And it tapers above O'Connell Street and passes above the city line. The next slide, please. With as slender and elegant a movement as is technically possible. The pattern at the base of the spire is derived from the double helix of DNA overlaid with a scanned image of granite from beneath the site. It represents the Irish diaspora, which at the time of the project was literally ebbing and flowing. And yet my sense of humor suggested that the fertility of humankind and the bedrock of the city, its aspirations and hopes could be conjoined and since the Irish have been to most parts of the planet, I'm sure they left seed. So I thought the DNA or the human DNA was an appropriate symbol. So as the ambient light reflects or is absorbed by its surfaces, it is ever shifting in appearance. It both incorporates and reflects its surroundings and as it engages in a dialogue, potentially of meaning with passers-by. But although it is a monument, we designed the spire to leave a space, a void, to be filled with the public's own hopes, aspirations, and meanings. The absence of overt, overt symbolism permits a personal interpretation and identification by the viewer. The competition jury recognized it as a primary element, a free point in the urban dynamic. The Spire of Dublin is a magnet, a place where there is nothing other than the notion of marking the center, a physical center which people can identify with. Nobody owns the spire, not even Dubliners. It is for everyone to relate to, to be inspired by, perhaps to find their own centrality. Next slide. A couple of years after it was actually up, I received a letter from a mother superior writing on behalf of a nun who was dying. The nun wanted to write, but could not, to thank me for giving her a beautiful reference to her God, her light, a votive candle. And despite its form, a symbol of peace for her. The mother superior also thanked me, but with no explanation. I smiled. The gift of giving is a central aspect in all of us. We know what joy it gives just to give. And it is the giving up of power or of control. So control, relinquishing control in the creative and interpersonal sense can open us up to the thrill of creativity and the richness of cooperation and mutuality. 
The inadvertent or unwilling loss of control in the personal, professional, or cultural sense is obviously altogether another matter. And that is when the void becomes the emptiness, like that at the center of our consumer culture, designed never to be filled. And the periphery becomes the neglected, the forgotten, the ignored, and the discounted, a zone of danger rather than richness. So if we look at cities and their centers, we're social animals. Even as nomadic people, we converge periodically, often in special locations, to exchange news, trade goods, and genes, genes, celebrate or engage in spiritual rituals, basically to connect. Settlements, villages, towns, and cities evolved and grew to fulfill the human need for centers of connexity. We soon also realized that certain human activities can be conducted more easily when clustered together rather than dispersed port cities and their associated crafts and trades, market towns where foodstuffs from the surrounding periphery were brought to sell, the great centers of Mediterranean Asian trade along the Silk Route, towns that grew up around universities like Karlsruhe, Oxford, Cambridge, where research centers now thrive, financial centers like London, fashion centers like Paris and Milan. Cities have always been rich centers of connectivity and diversity because they are dense in population, variety, races, cultures, and wealth. Even poverty in cities has power because the poor make the city function. Their density, complexity, and connectivity is one reason the great cities have absorbed invasions and outlived many and diverse systems of government, empires, monarchies, and dictatorships. But cities are more than centers of density. They are complicated organisms with lives of their own, many layered and culturally specific. They evolved in response to the surrounding environment and the unwritten but sensed needs and values of the communities which built them and were in turn shaped by them. There is a direct correspondence between the architecture of a city and its people. We now plan our city centers Rather than letting them grow, an urban design is an extraordinary complex endeavor, and implementing planning is very messy and very difficult. So not only reason, but also knowledge and theory are needed if we are to understand how buildings fit together to form civilized environments where communities can live in harmony and grace. Memory, imagination, and emotion are also needed. And we are slowly coming to the realization that in the rush to progress, we have left some of these behind, not only in architecture, but in our ways of relating to each other. So the human becomes decentered. Next, so that's the one. That's it. That's one. Back one. Sorry. The needs and values of those who drive the development of our cities have changed. The communities whose needs formed the urban fabric of cities have become marginalized, and market forces, capital, exert the primary influence on planning policy. The result is cities in which the powerless and poor, those who live in the periphery and who are unable or can't afford to benefit from what the center can provide, often survive in a state of resentment, which needs only a spark to become violent. The image there is of a water pipe going through one of the slum areas of Mumbai. And that water is not accessible to those people. It goes to the rich area of Mumbai. The disparity between center and periphery applies across the scale. Wealthy corporate CAOs and their underpaid staff. Wealthy cities surrounded by countryside with poor connectivity. Wealthy first world countries at the centers of the global economy supplied with goods and slave labor by poorer third world countries at the economic periphery. Capitalism's, capitalism's appeal has rested in its promise of individual control, that we would all be able to make our own choices and shape our own futures within a competitive system that would produce the greatest benefits for all. The philosophy is that the I is self-contained and self-sufficient, 
that we are distinguished and in isolated from other individuals and things of nature in an age of individualism, not community, of independence rather than interdependence. Initially, capitalism delivered many advantages. The last few hundred years have given us breathtaking advancements. Vast wealth has been fueled by a revolution in science and mathematics, medicine and technology, as has our understanding of the structure of the universe and at the level of subatomic particles. Standards of living have risen for many. Political liberalism has dominated. But the capitalist system grew into one dominated by vast corporations and global banks. An Oxfam analysis of 2016 data found that the poorest 50% of the world population own about $410 billion in total wealth. As of June 8, 2017, the world's richest five men owned over $400 billion in wealth. Thus, on average, each of those five owns nearly as much as 750 million people. Moreover, today's super-rich owe little or no loyalty to any nation or community. In previous eras, the wealthy were grounded within their own societies. This constrained their wealth and power within the bounds of reason, which is no longer the case. The power disparity inherent in such inequality is unequaled in history. Percibus Shelley's Ozymandias, otherwise known as Ramesses II, was clearly just an amateur. The global economy that fuels this wealth is interconnected, but the benefits of such connections are not reciprocal. They are primarily, primarily financial and competitive, with grossly unequal rewards. The human beings that produce and buy the goods that maintain the global economy are central to the equation only insofar as they are able to continue being consumers. Our demands are no longer organic once our basic needs have been satisfied. The void of community life abandoned in an age of dynamic urbanism is filled with manufactured needs created by advertisers in service to an economic machine that creates consumer demand in order to benefit from increased consumer spending. In the words of J.K. Galbraith, our wants are increasingly created by the process by which they are satisfied. So we now live to produce, to consume, and to waste. And the attention economy on social media, shaped by the demands of advertising, is depriving us even of the space and time and freedom to pause. Pause when we stop, reflect, open ourselves to the moment, and remember that the immeasurable is more important than can, what can be quantified. That's fine. Yeah, good. Our feeling of control over ourselves and our future is showing itself to be ever more illusory. The media, social and otherwise, has changed our societies in ways we are only now beginning to understand. Much of the information we get has been deliberately shaped to control our perceptions and opinions. Control of our emotions and thoughts by means of information gathered by us for 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 profit social media, which is designed to be psychologically addictive, has become so precise that Facebook was able to target individuals with tailored posts designed to influence their presidential and Brexit votes. When human beings are centered, they are able to live in a dynamic balance of all the interrelated physical and spiritual systems that, that are part of their lives. They communicate their sense of balance in the way they manifest their physicality, in the realization of themselves, and in their relationships with all beings and their environment. We have become decentered. We are recognized by our habits, what we look like and what we have. Our centers have become peripheral and of no consequence. Our sense that there is more, that our souls need feeding, our longing for a greater meaning and connection is unfulfilled. Luckily, in an age where everything, even our existential distress, has become commodified, we can buy mindfulness apps for that 
several in fact. Perhaps it is a hopeful sign that many people in their 30s and younger are restricting their use of social media and withholding it from their young children. Complaints about privacy issues, fake news, advertising, the impact it is having on real life and relationships might be a sign that the Pavlovian system of constant feedback being offered us is not as emotionally satisfying as what it is trying to replace. So society now is decentered from architecture. We may not be the only animal that creates its environment, but we are the only animal which deliberately creates environments which are dysfunctional. Architecture creates urban environments in the image of the philosophy on which it is based. Today's philosophy, capitalism first, and with it the ubiquitous high-rise skyline. For some time now, the rich and powerful have shaped our world more than they did in the past. The glass towers sprouting in cities worldwide, and for my part, I helped invent the technology that makes some of them possible with their glazing techniques, are monuments to wealth and might. Profit-driven development and ego-driven architecture are the manifestations of urban planning and architecture which no longer put society and cultural continuity at their center. The effect upon the buildings and public spaces and upon the global environment generally has been devastating. As cities lose their complex urban fabric of mutual influence and adaptation, they dehumanize the humanity that inhabits them and nature itself. Western capitalism has exported this phenomenon worldwide brilliantly. An advertisement by a well-known wealth management company neatly articulates this kind of development. Our waterfront has grown to include some of the country's most impressive buildings, which has serendipitously created the perfect backdrop for wealth managers to entertain their clients. <laughs> Ultra high net worth individuals are no doubt enticed by the aesthetics of the Albert Dock area. And what has previously been known as a back office hub for many wealth managers is now expanding to include a distribution and investments function. These impressive buildings express and evoke the least attractive aspects of the human psyche. Selfish and egocentric, they stand alone and isolated. They do not share walls or face each other. They rarely make places welcoming to the multifarious street life which makes a city alive. I would ask you a question to think about. When was the last time you went to a new part of a new city because you thought it might be really, really, really texturally nice? <laughs> they are urban spaces deliberately designed not to be lived in, but moved through. Spending, perhaps with a pause to buy a cappuccino. Corporate acquisitions of large chunks of public urban space is further transforming the urban fabric with implications for social structures and the richness of the urban fabric itself. In the 1970s, the spread of pseudo-public spaces in cities began. Ever more squares, urban complexes, parks and thoroughfares, which seem to be public, are actually owned and controlled by developers and their private backers. You see little signs which say, this is not a right of way, hidden. The arbitrary restrictions these entities impose on citizens that prevent them from exercising the rights to which they would be entitled on genuinely public land are frequently kept secret until they are unwittingly violated. I remember when Canary Wharf for, formally opened because we live in, it's in the back garden, so to speak. On the Saturday, we went with two friends with bottles of champagne, two bottles of champagne and six glasses. And the security people said, welcome. The following day, we each, the same people, went with six-pack beers, and we were not allowed in. <laughs> and that was 1987. On a larger urban scale, the answer to these problems is very much a matter of restricting the ability of private wealth to affect the development of the urban fabric. What politician in the current circumstances would dare move on that front? The free market approach of London makes this difficult. 
but even there, control, for good or bad, can be exercised by individuals with the power to influence the planning system. As the present Deputy Mayor of Paris, Jean-Louis Messica, who is responsible for architecture, urbanism, and economic development in the French capital, interesting combination, explained recently, quote, we don't accept to give the management of public space to the private sector. The question of how you manage the design of the city, of the streets, and who has the right to be in the streets, and how you share the rights of the different users of the public streets is very decisive in future. You also have the question of social mixing. A city where the poor and the rich can be in the same spaces because segregation is the worst problem for cities. You see it in Paris, you see it in London. The city that accepts segregation is a dying city. And in the words of Pascal Maragall Imira, the mayor of Barcelona during that city's development for the 1992 Olympics, said to an assembly of architects, the exteriors of your buildings are the walls of our public rooms. So we will have a say about what they look like because we have to live with them. So even as an individual architect, you can remain aware that you're answering to the needs of the public as well as your clients. The ability to discuss the design with the public is vital. In the case of the Sainsbury Welcome Center, my practice consulted local interest groups before any statutory authorities and extensively during the design process to make sure the way the building speaks with its immediate neighbors and the public is appropriate and interesting. That's Paris from the air. <clears throat> this kind of control isn't a utopian fantasy. In fact, it has been done very successfully in the past. In Paris is a very good example of what can be achieved when during the process of city planning, the right questions are asked to produce a coherent philosophy for city planning. I was very fortunate when I set up an engineering firm with Peter Rice, the rather wonderful Irish engineer, and Martin Francis. But at the end of the first year in 1981, I met the president of Lavinette, which was the new science center and would eventually become a new park in the north part of Paris and also the music center. The president was a man called Paul de Louvrier. He was about 73 years old and clearly been put out to grass at Lavinette. However, back in 1954, De Gaulle asked his secretary for someone to write a philosophy for Paris. And the secretary went out into the outer room and there were a number of enarchs, with these sort of political graduates. And the secretary asked the question and Paul de Louvrier put his hand up. He was 27 years old. And Paul de Louvrier spent the next year and he got round table gatherings of people like Simon de Beauvoir, Sartre, artists, musicians, geographers, urbanists, mathematicians, physicists, a series of round tables. He ended up with a pile of ideas. And of course, the secretary said, de Gaulle can't read. Not literally, but made the point, you better get this short. To cut a long story sh short, um, de Louvrier produced five pages. De Gaulle only read the first sentence of the first page at which point he brought it out and showed it to me, a copy. And it said, Paris risks falling into the Atlantic Ocean. <laughs> and what de Louvrier had put together in the first sentence was the sentiment by these combined brains of France that the Rhine would become the economic powerhouse, the economic banana of Europe, and Paris was too far west. So on the back of that, France reacted, not just Paris, and they built two years later the first nuclear electrical power station. They decided to build high-speed trains. They decided to build high-voltage power lines, all to feed Europe. And that's what they did. We came in in 1981 at La Villette, and you have to step back to find the relationship between a philosophy for Paris 
and this major French European ideal. Together with the physicality and the economic drive, Paul de Louvrier was actually the economist who set up the structure for the Economic Union of Europe. He wrote the first paper. I only discovered this 10 years ago, because that would have been another conversation worth having. He was also the man, quite young, who was sent out to conclude the Algerian War with the French, an economist. Now there are streets and squares in France named after him. But what it gave me was an insight into the value of thinking very, very big. I can say from the British Isles where I come from, <laughs> although I'm Scottish, I would say the English are incapable of philosophy today. I'm hoping the Scots will get their act together and I would rely on the Celtic fraternity to try and make it happen. Out of this philosophy, they went east-west, or west-east, north-south, Paris. Next slide. So I'm in the west, east is on the right, and out to the west, they decided to build what is La Défense, economic powerhouse, before anything else. Then they went east and built the ministries, new government buildings. But before they built that, they built the RER, number one, A, in French. That's interesting in itself. In London, we're getting all excited because we're building Crossrail. Well, since the French did RERA, they built, I think, another 15 Crossrails in Paris. The result then was to do RERB, going north-south, between Orly and Wassy. So they built a new airport. Le Bourget, fine, finished. And coming in from Wassy, from the north, was La Villette. 1981, 25 years or 27 years after de Louvier set about writing a philosophy for Paris, I was sitting talking with him, part of an overall picture that was still going on. Quite a revelation. De, de Louvier also set up the five new towns around Paris, of which most people know of Nanterre. He also set up the major hospitals around Paris. Amazing man. So suddenly you had a functioning city because of the infrastructure investment, whereas in London, Canary Wharf was built on the back of no infrastructure investment at all. They bought a second-hand noddy line from California called the Docklands Light Railway. It took about six years to function. But today, of course, I'm very fortunate. I live there, and we have an airport, and we have the boat, and we have Jubilee Line, as well as DR, and we have Crossrail. Hey. As a result of our work in Paris, in the center at La Villette, we were brought into the Louvre to do the pyramids, and then we were brought out to La Défense to, do, to help finish Breckelson, a Danish architect who died halfway through the building, the famous arch building. And that gave us an opportunity to then do a building that U2 and Bono decided to have on the cover of one of their albums, which is the 2F terminal at Wassy Airport. So we've seen everybody decentered, and now the architects are going to get decentered. The intellectual design and technical territory. Next slide, I think. Maybe. Yes, that's fine. The intellectual design and technical territory of the architect has been slowly eroded. There is no doubt that architects themselves and the way we are now educated have contributed to this. In current architectural teaching, the stress is placed upon knowledge and theory, the periphery, while emotion, the heart of architecture, its centre is constrained, considered immature when expressed strongly at crits, and particularly when it's unsupported by either knowledge or theory or both. So having a feeling and intuition is derided in most schools of architecture. Moreover, the architect's full range of skills, which used to be taken for granted, has become diluted through specialization and management. There's a few in the audience who are gonna laugh at this bit. Few architects now design with a deep knowledge of structure, materials, environmental physics, cost of systems and construction, 
acoustics and lighting, combined with a really good understanding of politics, law, economic, economic social structures, urbanism, planning, construction, and manufacturing industry. That's how I was trained, which makes me a pterodactyl, I guess. Without these skills, an architect is not in a position to advise municipal authorities on healthy urban infrastructure or to administer and control the process of delivering the building he's designed or she has designed. That has been taken over by management. The result has been the subjugation of design to process and the separation of the two, with the power of management increasing at the expense of architecture. As the management group grows, Conformity and ownerless decisions inevitably become allies. The growth of a risk-averse culture of chains of responsibility so long that nobody knows who is accountable have led to the marginalization of genuine experimentation, research, and innovation. It has also led to the marginalization of architecture in its broadest and most social sense, its ethical stance, because the values of architects and managers are different. That's why that image is on the screen. I think that most designers believe that they are essentially doing good. I think that the idea doesn't enter most managers' heads. The Grenville disaster, I think, is a case in point. The fundamental tragedy in our society today is that design, as is everything else, remains judged both qualitatively and quantitatively, by the question, does it attract the consumer? Can we as architects and engineers initiate a change in this aspect of our collective culture? The late American architect, Philip Johnson, one of the most influential figures in 20th century architecture, once said, whoever commissions buildings by me, I'm for sale, I'm a whore. The statement raised hackles in the architectural profession, as arrows into the center of a guilty conscience often do. Important social and political issues relating to planning, design, and architecture often slip through the cognitive dissonance required to reconcile ethical issues and the actions of those paying the architect's fees. Very few architects take an ethical stand or refuse to plan projects that perpetuate social inequality. And not everyone can afford to be righteous, especially financially. But some can and do. I remain personally hopeful that we can help make a change by going back to the fundamentals, and most important, standing firm on ethical issues and making our concerns public when we see unethical behavior within our profession. Some of you may not know of the Garden Bridge in London. It was a project of Joanna Lumley, of the red lipstick fame, who thought it was a good idea that she'd borrowed from somewhere else to try and convince first Ken Livingstone, the mayor of London, and failed. But no, for those that know, managed to convince Boris Johnson. The process by which this scheme by Studio Heatherwick got so far and spent close to 50 million pounds of public money was criminal from beginning to end. And I am sure that people will end up in jail on it. And I, not out of vendetta or anything else, but I was the only known architect to stand up in a public meeting and in the press condemning the procurement process and the illegal behavior of the Garden Bridge Trust. And I knew the chairman and the deputy chairman extremely well. And I could not believe what they were doing. It had come home to roost. The GLA, as of yesterday, had brought in the lawyers. And there's a separate private legal case about to start. It's important we talk when it's wrong. So a shift in perception. At the moment, 
there is no incentive for the market to solve society's problems, especially if the solutions hurt the market in the short term by persuading us to buy less, not more. The greatest financial rewards are still to be gained from not caring for others or our environment. And measuring progress and success by GDP is still totally embedded in our society's idea of civilization, despite our laments about the state of our biosphere and the widening economic gap between the wealthy and the poor. Decisions about what kind of cities and societies we want to live in and how we are to relate to the natural world are ones we have to make together. For those of us living in economically powerful post-industrial societies, it is about a fundamental change in the way we think, behave towards each other, design and make things. It is less a matter of curtailing people's freedoms than about gaining our freedom from the overriding influence of a consumer culture that appears to be making us and our environment very ill indeed. Only recently there has, been, has there been significant doubt as to the direction in which the developed world has been progressing. Optimism about the progress of humanity has given way to an understanding, despair in some, about our limitations and the imperatives of our technologically based and driven competitive socio-economic system. Doubt is becoming alarm as we learn centralized systems are unable to maintain order and coherence in societies linked by easy international travel and worldwide information networks which are subject to distortion by powers with hidden agendas. We are beginning to realize that progress is not only a movement, but also a direction. And that the direction we're taking has put us in peril. What we've thrown out in our rush to progress, we are now beginning to let back in. We are beginning to ask ourselves different questions. From where we derive our meaning? Where do we place our meaning? When we begin to recognize unbridled lust for wealth and power for what it is, a pathology which needs to be curbed by legislation if necessary, like any of the other addictions we recognize as damaging, we will be on our way towards a solution to what plagues our cities and societies. With luck, the compass will swing from due profit to due cooperation, to what a new paradigm predicated on the notion of sharing, a collective identity and empathy with our fellow beings and with our environment. We have the ability to create competitive new industries and products that pose no health risk, which positively serve us and our entire biosphere and are profitable. In other words, an altruistic competitive economy where the planet is the beneficiary, our biosphere. We have the ability to recreate social and economic structures that benefit us all without enriching only a few. Sometimes a small shift can have a great effect. Tony Ruttiman is a friend of mine. At the age of 18, he went to Ecuador as a result of a mudslide. He just gained a place, a scholarship at ETH in Zurich, was sitting in a restaurant with two mates, and he thought, having seen this news program, he discussed it with his two mates, and he had an image of sitting there when he's 65, probably as a professor, in the same restaurant, in the same town in Switzerland, having achieved nothing other than being a very good engineer. So he up sticks, with a few quid, he went to Ecuador. It took him two years to build his first bridge. When he first went there, he came back after a fortnight, devastated by the loss in a community and his inability to do anything to help. But his village in the mountains in Switzerland, the logo of, or the brand of the village, was a bridge. He begged, didn't quite steal, but he managed to get second-hand cables from the Swiss cable car company. He got second-hand pipes from a company in America. He has now completed more than 1,000 bridges. He has a backpack and a laptop, two laptops. He has storage of pre-cut pipes in four ports in South America and Southeast Asia. He has doorstep generals. He built a bridge between Ecuador and Colombia when they were at war. He's 
been in Myanmar for the last three years, and because he doesn't represent any of the institutional aid agencies, the generals in Burma or Myanmar accepted him, the same in Colombia, because he poses no threat. The average cost of his bridges, which range from 20 meter spans to that one, which is 250 meters, is about $8,000. He only builds them if the community will bring the sand, the cement, and dig the hole. He will arrange the rest. And he is the only person there giving the orders to the people of how to build the bridge. You do as I say. And a very good example is that, of that is steel sheets sometimes are the bed, bedding of the bridge going across. Four people, one at each corner, please. He saw some, a group of three carrying one. He asked them never to turn up again. In these thousand bridges, he's never had one single accident. Now that's an example of somebody small making a major shift. He has reconnected more than two million people in very damaged communities from mudslides and other natural disasters like earthquakes. So the last point I wanted to make was simply that the fundamental altruism of humans, every time there is a disaster, we always see collaboration and cooperation. It's part of our instinct for survival. And they take precedence over the values imposed upon us by a competitive socioeconomic system that we live with today. And I sense that we we sense that being in touch with the natural world is crucial to our inner selves every time we take a walk through the woods, along a beach, in the mountains, and why people in older age, when they're wiser, head for the country. So when you feel the pain of another, you behave differently. Next slide. Thank you. <laughs>